Okay, I want to talk about something I think it's sort of floated around our fellowship a bit, and that is that um, uh, Pastor Godfrey up in uh, Papua New Guinea, who has uh, seen that fantastic revival uh, up there of many thousands of people, has a saying, which is a simple saying. Here we go. Need this adjusting. Okay. Uh, and that is um, heaven or hell, your choice, no pressure. And I just want to maybe elaborate a little bit upon that. Maybe, uh, first of all, on the name, I want to talk about the, the horrors of hell compared with the haven of heaven and how that um, the Bible is really clearly states that there is a vast difference between them. And really, for those of us that have heard the gospel, anybody on planet Earth, really, that choice is always there. This choice that we either make or we don't get around to making. But if we don't get around to making it, then in a sense, it's made for us because uh, uh, we're either saved or we're not saved. Um, let's turn to, uh, first of all, to the book of uh, Genesis. Just have a little look at the early uh, paradise um, mentioned in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 1. Uh, Ge sorry, Genesis chapter 2. Um, by the way, the word paradise, uh, Brother Darrell and I were having a look at some thoughts on the word paradise. Um, here's though it's actually more a Persian word than it is a Hebrew or Greek word. And it sort of originated where the Persian kings and princes would have a, uh, a, a nice area where they would sort of rest, rest in. And sort of that was their paradise. And it, later on, it, it, it came into the Bible, not in the Old Testament, by the way, only in the New Testament. And the word's only used three times. One's to do with the thief on the cross. The other one is to, to do with the experience that the Apostle Paul had. And another one is in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, to do with the church at Ephesus. And uh, that's the only three times the word paradise is there. But it's the same word, and maybe it has... Uh, different connotations depending what part of the word there it appears and um, so anyhow we're going to look at that, that and I thought particularly in Revelation chapter 2 we're not turning there at the moment uh, it does define the Garden of Eden as paradise um, and I just thinking about how much God wanted the early people we might say of this planet to uh, have um, a lovely place and just there, uh, just grabbing some of the verses out of chapter 2. In verse 5, every plant of the field before it was in the earth, he planted, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. What it's doing is painting a bit of a picture of what we would call utopia. Maybe that's another word that describes what we're talking about. And uh, you can see here that God sort of was creating this atmosphere. This is even outside the Garden of Eden. This is the planet. Uh, maybe just jump down to verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. So there were places. We know later on I talk about the, the land of Nod, and here it's called the, the eastward in a place called Eden. So as we know, there were already people on the, on the planet from Genesis chapter 1, what we call the first creation, male and female, and they went out to go all over the earth. But here we have this special man called Adam. And God, even in the midst of that nice area, makes it even, you might say, a, 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 a nicer, private, a segregated area called the Garden of Eden. So in verse 8, he planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground uh, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree and the tree of life. So... The message I want to get home to you is he wanted to do good things for mankind. He wanted man to live, as it were, in utopia or even as equal to the, the Persian garden of uh, a pleasant garden and so on. Um, just in verse 15 it says, and he put uh, into the Garden of Eden, sorry, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. But it was not later on, as it were, in the sweat of his brow. Everything was, as we know, very nice. Um, 
Later on, of course, we see there in verse 18, uh, the Lord God said, it's not good for man that he should be alone and make him a help me. And we just see there that um, um, he made animals, and there's a, but that we know in the long run that it wasn't the full satisfaction. And later on, he made Eve. Um, and just there in chapter 3, just grabbing little bits here to paint the picture, in chapter 3, verse 8, it says, And they, that's Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This, of course, unfortunately, is after they've, they've disobeyed God. But I just thought again, what about that relationship? Maybe there's a lot in that verse to realise that what an amazing situation. There's this beautiful garden. There was no killing. There was no dying. There was no animals killing other animals. There was no, nothing like that at all. Adam and Eve were guaranteed life forever. And um, everything was high hockey-dory, even to the point of where they could talk to God and have this nice, pleasant with him. You know, people, you hear people again and again criticising the way um, God deals with things and why does God do this and why does God do that. Remember, it was man that made the choice in the beginning. It was mankind, Adam and Eve, you might say on our behalf, they chose to go the wrong way, not God. God, as you see, has set up everything really good and we know the tree of life was there and... Um, Everything would have, we don't know how long it would have gone on. But all of a sudden we know that the serpent, the devil threw the serpent, uh, deceived them, and they lost that beautiful um, relationship. You know, down in verse 25 of uh, chapter 3, it says uh, that they were both naked, and the man and the wife, but it says they were not ashamed. So there was a beautiful innocence there. There was no knowledge of badness. There was no knowledge of sin and all the horrors that go with it. There was nothing, no knowledge of any evil whatsoever. They had no feeling of guilt. Guilt didn't exist. Being ashamed didn't exist. Worrying didn't exist. Didn't have to worry about whether there was a drought or a flood or, or whether their crops were going to survive. None of that was there. It was paradise. It was utopia. And as we know, unfortunately, they moved away from the Lord and then hell started to come in. And we know the time of the flood, wow, did he hell come in big time and things had really gone belly up and there was sin and corruption and man was evil all the time. But I want to jump to chapter 3 of, of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and, oh, no, sorry, ch chapter 3, first of all, and just verse 8. I've got the wrong book. Exodus. Chapter 3 and verse 8, just one verse there where it describes talking about hell on earth and things that have really gone wrong. Suffering, you might say, the, the horrors of hell, but not in hell at this point, and no longer having the wonderful haven of paradise or, or heaven as they had. But in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, it says, where God says to Moses, we know the story of the burning bush, I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites. We might, I think there's seven, six different ites there, the, the people that, that are owned by all the different ites. Um, again, God wanting people to have the best. Remember, God always, that's what he wants. We're the ones that muck it up. So uh, what did he said there? Unto a good land and a large, flowing with milk and honey. It sounds a bit like what he originally set up in the Garden of Eden. And then Deuteronomy chapter 3, um, we just see here some beautiful words by Moses when, as we know, he uh, had made a mistake. And you might say that was typical of the Old Testament. One mistake and you were out. And... Uh, there was, in, um, and he represented the law. He, he was the one that God gave the law to. So in a sense, he suffered personally from the how exact that law was and how there was no deviation in it. Uh, and the Lord said because of that one mistake, when he beat the rock twice, when the Lord told him not to beat it even once, but just talk to the rock. We know that story. And uh, we see here, again, I just want to use what the words that he used to what this, again, like a paradise, 
was going to be set up by God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 23, where he's talking to the children of Israel just before they go into the promised land under the guidance of Joshua, he said there in verse 23 of chapter 3, I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to their might? Well, the simple answer is there is no other God at all. And then the way he describes the land in verse 25, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. So again, God was in a sense setting up another garden of Eden, a big one this time. Again, it was going to be a separate country and the people were going to be separate, a little bit like the Garden of Eden. He was going to surround them with blessing. He was actually going to give them country that belonged to all those other different people there at the end of verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 8. But he said, that's how he said it's going to be a great, but I want to go there, he was saying. Please let me go there. And because he'd broken the law once, he wasn't allowed to. But we do always point out that he did eventually get there on the Mount of Transfiguration when uh, uh, Jesus went up on the mountain and Moses and Elijah and uh, appeared there with, with uh, Jesus. But we won't go into that story now. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Here we see sort of some descriptions of maybe what we call a millennium. We can't nail it down 100%, but everything sort of indicates that this sort of paradise again, this uh, utopia, God is thinking one day or, or prophesying one day. So Isaiah chapter 11, just in verse 6, it says, the wolf, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will die down with it, a bit like the Garden of Eden. Remember it says there was no killing. All the animals were vegetarians at that time. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall, shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play at the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Then shall not, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Um, just like our sister said at the end of her testimony, I can't wait for that day to come. He's going to, this, what he describes here is not going to happen until the Lord comes back. So this is, there's no doubt when you read these scriptures that it's God's intention for one way or the other for us to have a haven called heaven, whether it be maybe even now, and I'll look at that in a minute, in our life or in the life here. Let's go to Job and wonderful words of Job in chapter 19. So in actual fact, in the Old Testament, there's not many references to the hereafter. Their utopia was the one we just read about. Their utopia was the land of Israel, the land flowing with milk and honey. And often when people died, there wasn't some thought, oh, one day they'll be in heaven. But there is one exception to what I just said, and this wonderful passage in Job uh, chapter 19. By the way, Job, again, it's very difficult to nail some of this down. But one thought is that Job was actually at the time of when the children of Israel were in Egypt for that 215 years that they were there. And... Um, and the Job, you might say, outside of where they were, was the godly man. And he came from the east over towards the border of, of the Mesopotamian Valley, possibly a descendant, all this is possibility, of Keturah, the, uh, the uh, wife, the, the third wife, you might say, of Abraham, and how that it says that his descendants moved over there. We don't know exactly. But what we do know, Job was a very godly man. And um, he uh, had this prophecy, you might say, uh, in verse 23, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, he got his wish. We're here today reading it. That they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, 
yet in my flesh I shall see God. So he's basically describing a miracle here. He said, I'll be just dust, and yet somehow or other I'm going to be there in some sort of a form. In verse 27, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He had this great confidence that one day everything was going to come together, and the Lord was going to come back, and he was going to set up that utopia. Again, similar to what we read before in Isaiah, let's go back to Isaiah again. We see again God's prophecy, you might say, of what we now think is going to be the millennium. Digressing for a second on the millennium, we don't know exactly the purpose of the millennium. We can have a guess at it, and there's nothing wrong with having that. But doesn't spell it. I just say the main thing I'll say about the 1,000 years before eternal life is that there is a purpose. God wouldn't have put it there before the eternal ages if there was not a purpose. And we can guess at all the different purposes of that. But obviously God feels that it needs to be there to achieve what he wants to eventually achieve uh, before we move in with God coming down and dwelling with us beyond the, the thousand years. So here we see in Isaiah 65 and verse 17, he says, the prophet says, for behold, although God through the prophet says, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. I think that's a good thought. By the way, we will know each other, I believe. I believe that. Like, like we just read, Job said, it's going to be me. It's not going to be somebody else when the Lord comes. It's still going to be me in a different form. Um, but we just see here, it goes on to say, in verse 18, but, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in, in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more, I think, an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. Again, it's a bit difficult to fully picture this. But he's sort of painting that things will be different. I think one thing you, you realise is the curse that came in after the, uh, the Garden of Eden. Um, I'm going to digress again. God put beings called cherubims to stop Adam and Eve going back and being able to eat of the tree of life. You can't have access to the tree of life anymore. He put up these things called cherubims. Now, cherubims do have wings. There's no description in the Bible that angels ever had wings. But cherubims do have wings. And we know later on there's a couple of examples of that, of when there they were for, for, uh, stopping Adam and Eve coming back in. And then later on with the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubims with their wings uh, meeting over the top of what was called the mercy seat. And the Shehinah glory was between the wings of the, of the cherubims and the mercy seat and the, uh, and the law and so on. Again, it formed a form of separation. And then just near that, where the Ark of the Covenant was, there was the huge big veil, and interwoven into the, into the veil were cherubims with their wings. And we know that separated us from the Lord, and later God got rid of all that. So there you are, little digression. Verse 20, uh, we read that, verse 21, And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They sh shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another reap, for as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So what it's describing, I believe here, is the curse that came after Adam and Eve were driven out, and in the sweat of your brow, in the toil of, of your life, you'll, you'll, you'll have to go through that time. Now it seems like people are still there, still living and dying. It's sort of hard for us to imagine that. In the millennium, we don't exactly know what it means there. People are going to live, they're going to build, but there'll be no damage, there'll be no war or anything like that. And the curse is going to slowly lift off and people are going to start living longer again. So it's a funny, we don't know exactly how it all comes together. But what we do know is it describes yet again a utopia. It describes a paradise, you might say. Um, verse 23, they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, 
I will, re- I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf, that's similar to what we read earlier in Isaiah, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. By the way, we often say the lion shall lie down with the lamb. It's actually no, no, no this, that simple statement's not there, but we know what it means. It's along the same thought. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, saith the Lord. When you think of Palestine right now and all the war and the fighting and all that, well, obviously, in, in what he describes here, that's all going to go. I want to turn to Luke chapter 16. There's an interesting parable here that um, maybe it's a little hard to fully nail down what uh, uh, the Lord was describing. Now, a parable, and he told lots of them, is a story with a spiritual meaning. It has a, a natural application, but it has a spiritual meaning, which people don't always fully understand. Like the time of uh, when Jesus gave the, the story of the sower and the seed and how it fell on four different types of terrain. Some just on hard rock, never germinated, the birds of the air gobbled it up. And that is the majority of people that hear the word of God and then they never get to base one. Nothing ever beyond that. They reject it straight away. And that is, unfortunately, the majority of people that hear the word of God. Then there's the next lot that do hear, may even get saved. But because they haven't really thought enough about it, they haven't committed themselves, and when a bit of trouble comes, you know, they, they leave. I mean, I've been in the Lord now 63 years. I must have, through our, just our little fellowship compared with the world, seen thousands and thousands of people baptized and spirit-filled. To me, it's almost like the world is half full of spirit-filled people that never got beyond the first week. Uh, when we introduced follow-up many years ago in Adelaide, it was a realization that when we baptized somebody on Sunday, and they didn't turn up next Sunday. We lost them on that day. No, you didn't. You lost them on Monday because they went home on Monday and mum and dad didn't like what they'd been. The works mates didn't. And by Monday night, they were, they were heading out. That's when we brought in follow-up. Let's get to these people as quick as we can after they get converted to at least give them a better chance. Then, of course, the third terrain it was uh, good. It was good soil, but it was people that had got beyond the the initial uh, challenge, but then they let, and that can happen any time in our walk of the Lord. They let other things creep in. We talked about the, the cares of the world and, and this and that, and you know, and all of a sudden they start missing out in their walk of the Lord, and they, they don't even know they're dying, but they're dying as, they, as other things creep in. But finally, there was some good soul that didn't have any of those problems, and now people that do walk on with the Lord. So that's an example of a parable. And the disciples didn't understand it. They came and said, what's all that about? And the Lord had to explain what he was talking about. So this is a parable where the Lord is making some points. He's not necessarily saying this is exactly how it's going to be. And I maybe want to look at the points that it's making more than, oh, that's what's going to happen. So in Luke, by the way, this is following the story in, in Luke chapter 16 of what's called the unjust steward. Somebody who should have walked with the Lord honestly, but he robbed the, his God. It's an amazing story. And he was actually talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You read later on in the chapter when they ridiculed him, he said, you're the ones that justify yourselves before. So that's who he was talking about. But here we just see, um, and that was a parable too, by the way, of course, of the unjust steward. But here's following that. This, By the way, it only appears in the book of Luke. You won't find this story in any of the other Gospels. And like a lot of things, often just once, that doesn't make it not important, makes it very important, singles it out. Get reading, Jock. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, uh, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. We often point out the dogs did more for him than what the rich man did. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now, as I said, if we maybe literally think we're going to be lifted into Abraham, I'm not 
quite sure that's going to happen. In fact, in fact, when you read later on the description of what it's going to be like when the Lord comes back, you're going to rise to meet the Lord. So it's just a story saying sort of like, I've got some points I want to make. That's what I think is important with this. Uh, what were the points that he was making? Verse 23, in hell, he lifted up his, his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So you might say point number one is the alternative to hell, to heaven, is hell, and it's a place of torment. You know, there's maybe over the years lots of questions about how it's going to be and this or that. I think the message he's trying to say is don't go anywhere near that. Don't let that even be a consideration because he's trying to emphasize here you want to be saved and you want to stay saved and you don't want to leave this planet and go to this place. Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So twice it uses the word torment. Doesn't sound a very uh, nice place to be. Who wants to be tormented? And particularly forever sort of thing. But, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside this, and this is another great big point he's making here, of verse 26 in particular, I'll read it. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf, and the word is fixed. You can't alter it. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. It's so permanent, and it's, it's one, so you, really we only have one chance in this life to make that choice. You can't have a bit of a taste and go, oh, I don't like this. I think I'll go back and get saved. No, he's saying, no, that it's all fixed. And once you're there, you're there. Uh, it's a bit like the, the terrorist demonstrating to the young would-be um, um, people that blow themselves up. He said, watch this carefully. I can only demonstrate it once. So... Um, that was supposed to be a joke, by the way. Let's go over the page. Not a very good joke. Um, verse 27. Then he said, uh, then, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that they testify unto them. Again, here's the point he's making, lest they also come into this place of torment. The word torment's bobbed up three times here. I don't want to go anywhere near anything like this. And that's what he's trying to say to us. He's not saying that's exactly how it's going. He's just saying, i got some big points I want to make with you here. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let, uh, them hear, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they, would, they will repent. By the way, it's the first word of what we use as a step of salvation. Up until now, it hasn't actually, it just talks about somebody had a good life and somebody had a bad life. And again, that's not enough to, we know to get into heaven. I'll just be a good person and, and so on. Although maybe it's the opposite. I'll have a horrible life so that later on I'll have a good life. It's not really making that point at all. He's just saying that um, you need to do something and you need to do what, and that is the big final point in this parable, you need to do what the Bible says. And in verse 31, And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, we would now say the word of God, all of it, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And we've seen that I mean, many times, haven't we, over the years, where some people have had the most amazing miracles, either to themselves or witness it, and yet that still doesn't convert them. Because the, the reason being is that the Lord said, my sheep hear my voice and follow me regardless of what's going on. I mean, the early church had great revival when everything was really bad. They had great revival when the church was being massively persecuted. You think, well, why would I want to become a Christian? Look what's happened to them. And yet in that, that's when people came to the Lord. So um, we just don't want to forget the fact the reason people come is that the Lord's sheep and they listen to his voice. 
and that's why they come and so on. So as I said, I'm talking about both hell and heaven today, hopefully talk a bit more about heaven in a minute. All I know is that that other place, whatever way you want to look at it, you don't want to go there at all and you want to walk with the Lord right now. Don't leave it to the last minute. Don't ever leave it to the last minute. I remember giving a talk in uh, Sydney many, many years ago and uh, when I was trying to encourage people at the end of the meeting, what we call an altar call, to come out and get baptised and get spirit and so on, I said, because if you leave here today, you know, tomorrow you might get run over by a bus. It's the saying, isn't it? Well, the next day in George Street, Sydney, Helen and I are walking along a very crowded footpath. If you know what Sydney's like at five o'clock at night, in the main street of Sydney, and a big wide footpath, and there was a car pulled across the footpath to pick up somebody because you couldn't park, pulled off the road, uh, and waited for the traffic to clear and so on. So I was, came up to the car as he stopped right across the footpath. And I thought, I'll go around him. And I went to step off, realising there was no bike lane, there was no verge, that that uh, pathway, that road, was up against the gutter. And as I went, to a guy behind, never said anything, he just grabbed me by the shoulder. And the next second, a bus went through about that far away from me. And I would have fulfilled my prophecy of the day before. The only advantage would have been was I was saved. The other person wouldn't have been. So you never know. Mark chapter 3, let's have a look at that. Just maybe some more points on this. Just grab a few scriptures. that Mainly I want to bring them out that we don't want to go anywhere near that. You know, I, I remember somebody talking to me about it and I said, I hope I never find out about it. I don't want to know anything about it. Whether my predictions about it are right or wrong, it doesn't matter. I don't want to ever be in a position to actually find out whether I was right or wrong because I want to be a long way away from that. Mark chapter 3, verse 29, where Jesus said in one of his great statements, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of not just damnation, eternal damnation. Matthew chapter 5, if you wouldn't mind turning there, just grabbing some of these statements on where we don't want to be when we either die or the Lord comes back. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22 says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, or shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Down in verse 29 of the same chapter, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is for it is profitable for thee to, that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30 says, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. We know this has got a, again, not a literal fulfilment, a bit like a parable. I mean, the things that would prevent us going to the kingdom of heaven. Part of my testimony is... Um, before I came to the Lord, I was hooked on foot on well, football mainly, but on sports. And uh, I think some of you know my testimony. Might be one or two that don't. But uh, I was only 17 at the time. But I, I loved sports. Summertime it was swim, swimming and cricket and cricket and tennis. And winter it was mainly Aussie rules football. And um, when I came to the Lord, I received the Holy Spirit on March the 7th. It happened to be between the seasons, the cricket. Swimming, tennis was fading out, and Aussie rules football was coming in. And I was playing for one of the Adelaide teams called Sturt in the in the Colts. I wasn't all that good, by the way. It sort of paints a picture as a good football. I wasn't, but I was maybe reasonable. And um, and yet I'd only been in the Lord two weeks when the footy season started. And before I came to the Lord, that was my God. It wasn't just a bit of sport, a bit of fun. I lived for football. I remember being down at Glenelg once teeming with rain nobody else came hardly it was one of those days where it rained all not just showers and i'm standing there with my team and uh thinking you know that's how dedicated anyhow two weeks after i came to the lord i'm at school all day uh still at school and footy practice started that night it was i think it was a tuesday night and uh and i had a little devil sitting on one shoulder 
not literally, but well, a parable, a little devil sitting on one shoulder and a little angel sitting on the other shoulder. And uh, the little devil was saying, yeah, you can do it. You can do both. You can be a Christian and still be part of your addiction. And the little angel was saying, no, if you do that, it's going to muck up your whole new life. But anyway, unfortunately, by the time I got home, the little devil had won. And I go into my bedroom and I get my footy gear, my boots and all what you go to footy practice. And I'm walking through the lounge room uh, to go off to footy practice. And the Baptist elder came. We were in a Baptist church. We came to the Lord. He came to try and talk us out of what we'd done. And for the next hour, we went backwards and forwards. And by that time, my mum and dad and myself, we knew the whole Bible. Well, we knew Mark 16, Acts 2 and John 3. That was enough. That's all we did know, really, but that was enough. And went backwards and forwards, and finally he stormed off, and I never got to footy practice. It was a great loss to the sporting world, but I never got there. And uh, But I praise the Lord. It's time like you've got to make a decision. You don't want to go there. Um, yeah, let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Just various verses on this. Don't need to hammer it too much. Uh, verse 28, John chapter 5, verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all they that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. They're both resurrections, by the way. One is a living death and the other is a living life. And... Uh, we just, hey, I keep saying we don't want to go anywhere near that. Um, although if you do decide that's not such a bad thing, you don't have to do anything to get it, all right? Just live your life on earth, normal life, good or bad, doesn't matter. This will be what you'll get. But if you want the living life, you've got to do what the Bible says. You've got to get saved. You've got to repent. You got to get baptized. You got to get filled with the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in tongues. But don't just stop there. You got to walk on with the Lord, and you got to live the life, as they say, and walk the walk, and all those terms to get that wonderful thing called the resurrection of life. In verse twenty-five of Matthew, Matthew twenty-five. Just a point it makes here, and one of the parables again, at the end of that parable in Matthew 25, verse 29, for unto every one that shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but unto him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. I won't go into the parable, I just want to make the point it makes here. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. That's bad enough in itself, isn't it? There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you're aware of things enough to weep. And as Pastor Jack Clay used to say, if you haven't got teeth, you'll be gnashing your gums. So one way or the other. Chapter 25 and verse, go back to verse 10. While they went to buy, this is the parable of the virgins, 10 virgin, virgins, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. But it says the door was shut. Is that that separation is there, isn't it? Afterwards came the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, uh, Verily I say unto you, I don't even know you. That's a horrifying thought. To get saved, fall away, and your name's, he looks it up in the book of life, and it's not there. It's not there. You might say, check it again. Check it again. It's not there. Uh, we want to make sure it's there. And by the way, how do you get it there? It's when you do those steps of salvation, of faith and belief, enough to repent, get baptized, fill with the Holy Spirit, and your name is then in the book of life. And it's up, the ball's in our court then, whether that stays in the book of life or not. Not that we've got to be perfectly good, not at all. We know that we make mistakes, but we have what's called a repentant heart, and we turn back to the Lord, and he's ever forgiving us. Um, Matthew chapter 7. And we'll leave, we'll leave hell behind. We'll go back to a bit of heaven. Matthew chapter 7 says, uh, 
in verse 21, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. As we said, you've got to live the life. Many shall say to me in that day, Father, when you think of what it says here, this is talking about spirit-filled people. They are the only ones that do what's described in this verse. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? That is the description of the Pentecostal revival. He then says, um, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, Ye that work iniquity. So they had got saved and they mostly did all that, but somewhere there they got their lines crossed. Something went wrong. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. I better not go too much longer. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. And just the first words of John the Baptist were in verse 1 In those days, John the Baptist came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says pretty well exactly the same thing. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So going back to those great passages of the Old Testament, he's saying, here we go again. Here's another opportunity to escape. Uh, first of all, from what we might call hell on earth, then later on, eternal damnation. You can. I'm going to provide a place. Now we're talking about, as it were, the, the world of Christianity. Now, I mentioned the thief on the cross, and I won't turn to that today. Talks about Jesus said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. I may, I may want to make one point about the thief on the cross. Cross. He was Old Testament. Remember that he was Old Testament. When people try to say, well, he got, as it were, saved. No, it doesn't use that word. But let's say he... He, he had that promise, we, whatever Jesus said to him, it doesn't matter. He, he couldn't get uh, baptized. Why? He was, he was on a cross. He, he couldn't receive the Holy Spirit because that was still a few days away, 50 days away, as it were. He couldn't, so he couldn't do either of those things. And whatever he, state he was in, he was the same as, we'll pick somebody in the Old Testament. What about Jacob? or Joseph, some of the great men of the Old Testament, they come under that category, John the Baptist, I dare say. So that is not an alternative. Don't ever use the thief on the cross to say, oh, I don't need to get baptised and spirit-filled to be saved. You need to get baptised and spirit-filled to be saved. Um, so let's have a look at 1 Corinthians, a little bit of a heaven that is the life hereafter. We talked about uh, the haven of heaven and the Apostle Paul had a little bit of a taste of that. Just a taste, a little glimmer for you and I. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says in verse 1, It is not expedient for me, doubtless... Is it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians, isn't it? I've got 1 Corinthians written down here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, am I right? Is it, it is not ex expedient for me to doubtless the glory. I'll come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body uh, uh, I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one has caught up to the third heaven. What are the first two heavens? Planet Earth is first heaven. The universe is the second heaven. The third heaven is the presence of God another level. I knew such a man, whether he goes through that again, I cannot tell. In verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise. I said this word indicates a place of tranquility. We'll just leave it at that. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. I mentioned before in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, if you want to write that down, you're writing scriptures. God said, uh, well, why won't you? Well, let's turn to it. I've got We've got, all, we've got till midnight, haven't we? I think we have. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I'll give to eat of the tree of life. So the access is there again. The cherubims wouldn't let Adam and Eve eat it. But we're going to have access to the tree of heaven, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, which we know originally was the Garden of Eden. And maybe the whole thought, the one that Paul saw, is going to be the new one. Um, 
I want to just think on the paradise, you might say, if I can, maybe I'll just read, of our situation right here and now, what we call the church. The, the, why we give a testimony like our sister gave. We come out of hell on earth sometimes. and We've come into what we call the fellowship. It's a taste of the heaven to come. It's not perfect. We know that. There's faults and there's mistakes and all that. <clears throat> but compared with what it's like outside the fellowship, outside the body, it's, there's a huge com comparison. So Acts chapter 2, where we know the day they received the Holy Spirit, it gives a description of a little bit of heaven on earth. In verse 41 it says, And then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's called revival. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily uh, with one accord in the temple. That wonderful unity. I'm going to digress for a split second. WhatsApp is a bit like this, isn't it? It's become a daily part of our fellowship, whether it's your local uh, uh, Geelong WhatsApp. I, I got on quite a few of them. I'm on the Launceston one and so on. So we've got plenty in Adelaide. Where I noticed daily, uh, our sister that gave the testimony, she's on almost every day saying pray for this, which is great. That's what we want, people sharing whatever they're going through and others praying and helping them on that occasion. So they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour of all the people. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's a haven. We don't want to leave that haven. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. And then I'll just finish with a couple of comments. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, um, where it talks here in verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the saints of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So right now we have a taste of heaven. It's not heaven. We know that. And we're looking forward to it. I'm just going to finish with a couple of thoughts. Um, and all they're just thoughts. Moments of often people talk about hell on earth. Hell on earth. And I just thought about some of them. Uh, we mentioned the children of Israel in bondage in, in Egypt was hell on earth. I think about the slave trade and the horrible things not only the people did to the African people, what about here in Australia? What happened to our local native people, particularly in the early days? Some horrendous things that people did, white man did sort of thing. What about the Holocaust? You talk about hell on earth. Unbelievable. Adam had no idea where he was going when he said to Eve, yeah, I'll have a bite of that fruit as well. He opened this Pandora's box. And the only person that can close it is the Lord when he comes back. So we have war and destruction. Right now we have the horrendous war in Ukraine. So hell on earth all over the place. Before I talk about some of the he heavens on earth to finish, there was a moment in the Old Testament that was maybe above all. And um, it was the time when the Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon. But they believed that in the reign of Solomon, it was the epitome of all the blessing that God promised the children of Israel. And she came down to search him out. She'd heard a great, re what we call a testimony of what his kingdom was like. She said, I had no breath in me. It was so marvellous. When I beheld this and when I beheld that. So that was a time of utopia. It didn't last long, by the way, even the next generation with Rehoboam and Jeremiah, things went belly up. But for a few moments, there was that. And I just got to think about a couple of um, heaven on earth uh, experiences. One that flipped to my mind was at the end of the Second World War on what was called VE Day. And um, I was saying to Helen, what image comes into your mind 
of the ego. We're pretty well on the same page. He talked about the crowds in London. But I said, not only the crowds in London, is, is Churchill giving the, the victory sign up on the, on, the, on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. That was a, sort of an amazing day with King George the Sixth and so on, all there. What a day of, you might say, um, heaven on earth. And then later, only a few weeks later, on the 15th of August 1945, when we won the war against Japan. And again, I said to Helen, what image flashes into your mind? Does anybody have an image that flashes into your mind on v, what they called uh, VP Day, Victory Peak for the City? Okay, the one flashes into my mind is the American sailor bending the girl over backwards, giving her a kiss. Do you know that photograph? It's an amazing photograph. That image came to me of the, the victory. I don't know what the young lady thought of that. She must be, ch be charging with assault these days. But anyhow, it, it looks like an incredible day. Um, and I think, I think I ran out of time about half an hour ago. One couple of little things I want to mention in the days of revival. I think about our fellowship, how it connects back to the Azusa Street revival. We think of great people that brought revival like Smith Wigglesworth and George Jeffries. The guy who came to Australia called Frederick Van Eyck from South, Af uh, South uh, uh, um, Africa. And our fellowship started from that. A um, couple of, two, just to finish on, Karakalinga Camp last Christmas. Who went to that? It was, I've been to a lot of Karakalinga camps and you don't know how they were like. They were good, by the way, but that blew me away. Mostly, I hate to say it, maybe it never happened again. We had the Victorians because you didn't have a camp. We had the, the Kiwis because they didn't have a camp. And I think we had one or two from Canada. We did. And plus a lot of people came. It was an amazing, it really was a little taste of heaven. Never forget that if you're there. If you weren't there, you can look at all that. And the last one, I thought a few weeks ago, we had the International Convention. And I've been to lots of those. I've been to 30 or 40 of them over the years. But again, it was really special. So we're already having a taste of what it's like to walk with the Lord. Well, make sure we hang in there, brethren. And if you're not saved, hey, be careful. Tomorrow you might get run over by a bus. Okay, I'll hand back to Pastor, to Brother Darrell.